So hello everyone, welcome to another edition of Edison TV. I am Pui Hamami, healthcare analyst at, at Edison. And with me today is James Graham, the CEO of Reiki Pharmaceuticals. Thank you very much for joining us, James. And we look forward to this timely update given the recent exciting news. Hello, thank you for having me. So congratulations on having enrolled the first patient in the Indonesian phase three study for lead candidate topical R327 gel or R327G in diabetic foot infections, as this is clearly a major milestone for the company. Please remind us of the diabetic foot infection landscape in terms of what types of treatments exist and how R327 topical gel, gel can benefit patients with this condition. Look, uh, the diabetic foot ulcer infection market is enormous. Uh, the challenge, of course, of treating diabetic foot ulcers, ulcers is really driven by getting an active compound, in this case, of course, a new class of antibiotic, to the site of infection. What they currently do is they'll debride and then they'll give the uh, patient existing antibiotics. They'll start broad and hopefully narrow in. But of course, one of the challenges, among other challenges of diabetic foot ulcers, is there's so many different types of bacteria. They call them polymicrobial in the, in the case of so many different types of bacteria that is the underlying infection in that ulcer. The other key challenge you have when um, uh, prescribing or, or administering to that patient is why did the ulcer begin in the first place? Because the vasculature in the lower foot or lower extremity has, has collapsed and the ulcer is, has began and about 80, 90% of those ulcers get infected. So delivering uh, antibiotics through vasculature, IV or oral uh, in a systemic fashion just doesn't have a chance of getting to the site. So the, our gel formulation goes directly onto the wound. Uh, it works in minutes instead of hours or, or days as many other antibiotics. And it works broader than any other antibiotic known to date. So that really lends itself to be the ideal diabetic foot ulcer infection treatment. Okay. And, and R327G has a novel mechanism of, of action. So how does that provide any benefits compared to other antibiotic or my, antimicrobial treatments? Well, I think that novel mechanism of action is key. Uh, if we look to particulars of that, what does that mean? It means it works broader than any other antibiotic known to date. So it works on the full suite of escape pathogens, being the acronym of, of uh, the different bacterial names. Uh, it works in minutes rather than uh, hours or days of existing antibiotics. And importantly, it works and keeps on working with repeated use. It's not um, resistant to any bacterial species. In fact, we've gone as far and wide as, you know, the CREs, the MRSAs, anthrax, and so on and so forth. It's a very, very broad, broad acting. So administer with confidence that it will overcome whatever type of bacterial infection exists in these complicated diabetic foot ulcers. Okay. And, and what kind of clinical data has Reiki already reported or supported with for R327G in diabetic foot infections? And does this provide you confidence for the new three, phase three study? Enormous confidence. So it's founded upon the success of our phase two studies. Our phase two studies was actually across two categories. One is diabetic foot ulcer infections as, as a particular focus. The other category is ABSSI infections, which is the broader spectrum and it stands for acute bacteria skin and skin structure infections. But that also includes diabetic foot ulcer infections. So among those two, we treated or some, or maybe 40 persons. And we actually found to have a 93% success rate in our treatment, according to the, I think it's the Bateman-Lipsky scale, or certainly the FDA uh, recognized scale of assessment. So 93% uh, success in 14 days is incredibly high. Uh, and then of course, most importantly, when you move from a phase two to phase three, keep the protocol the same. If you can keep the protocol the same, the results are probably gonna be pretty similar. And that's what we've done. The protocol's the same, the patients are virtually the same, and, um, and certainly the, the underlying uh, tre treatment methodology is the same too. And, and what do you see as the market size in Indonesia and in the ASEAN countries, which the study is based on for diabetic foot infections in general? Well, why we went to Indonesia was a fewfold. Firstly, the Indonesian government, in fact, came to us. Uh, why would they do that? Because uh, Indonesia is one of the highest diabetes populations in the world. So think 280 million people in Indonesia, 11% have diabetes. 
And about 40, well, in fact, 40% of those who have diabetes will get a diabetic foot ulcer. 80% of those become infected. So Indonesia as a, as a patient capture opportunity was important, but most particularly, if you're approved in Indonesia, as this is a registration or phase three study, your data is approvable into the ASEAN group of countries. So you go from a, a general population of 280 million people to an addressable, registrable population of about 690 million people, of which the uh, diabetes incidence is around 10%. And, uh, you know, you mentioned Indonesia came, the government came to Reki. Uh, what, what sort of support has the Indonesian health authorities provided for this phase three DFI study? Look, I, I got to say, working in, uh, obviously, I'm, I'm very Australian. I'm here in Sydney at this moment. Uh, when you go to Indonesia and you meet with, um, uh, particularly, I met with the uh, Ch chief health minister and the in head of the Indonesian FDA, known as Badampom or BPOM. And it was, it was a cultural experience where they, they quite literally say to you, you know, I, I give you my hospitals, I give you my personnel, I give you my logistics, and, and they really give you whatever um, resources or assistance they can do. Then you come back, back to the Australian side and you say to the Australian government, what are you, what are you going to do to, to, uh, to have this wonderful bilateral opportunity? And they say, well, we'll extend the Australian R&D rebate, which is 43.5% cent R&D rebate, across to include Indonesia as well. So all of our R&D done in Indonesia is in fact captured under the 43.5 cents R&D rebate, which extends our, our, um, our research ability, extends our cash runway, and it's a non-dilutionary cash benefit to the company. And so focusing on the actual phase three study that's now ongoing in Indonesia, how many subjects do you expect to recruit? And can you say uh, how many tri trial sites there will be and will they Will there be Australian study sites as well as part of the study? That's yes. <clears throat> so the study for diabetic foot ulcer infections as a registrational phase three study is done in Indonesia for the purposes I mentioned. Running in parallel to that, there is a separate study in Australia for the broader application of acute bacteria skin and skin structure structure infections. What that really means is we have one in Indonesia, ASEAN, Middle East, North Africa, MENA, group of countries, maybe UK and beyond for the highest price premium of the topical applications, which is DFI. In Australia, we have ABSSSI. For Australia, great, but for focus upon the US FDA. It's an FDA um, uh, recognized protocol. Answering your question of how many, uh, the study itself is expected to recruit in total 300, but we have a interim data point at around 140, 150 patients. And how do we get that in interim data point? It's because of the ability to produce statistically significant outcomes when comparing to placebo. Um, and statistical significance is deemed to be around 140, 150, and that would expect it to, is expected to be achieved in the first quarter of next year, giving the potential with our expedited regulatory review status to have an approvable drug really around the middle of 2026, which is an incredible achievement. So, so basically, if I understand correctly, that according to the timelines and the milestones that you're expecting, you, you believe that you're on track to potentially have this in the market in calendar 2026. That's right. So, so I should note the study by way of continuing to recruit patients would occur in the background. That's all well budgeted in. But the approvability uh, is on that statistical, statistically significant data point. Uh, and that data point, yes, is expected at the end of uh, Q1 next year. Uh, with the with the potential to be approved uh, in the middle of next year, and so with with that uh, timeline, how do you envision Reki's potential transition towards being a commercial stage company following this Indonesian trial? Are you looking at any partnerships or distribution agreements to bring R three two seven G to this uh, this region? We are yes, we have a memorandum of understanding with a leading Indonesian pharmaceutical company. Uh, in fact, my colleagues at the airport here in Sydney picking up uh, their managing director as has arrived for further discussions on the point as we speak. Uh, but I really see what is what is a pharmaceutical company in that region or any region, frankly, marketing and distribution. Uh, we are wonderful inventors, uh, ourselves being recce, uh, but we don't have marketing and we don't have distribution. So really, uh, they are, are the intended um, partner, I suppose, in that uh, in that instance. So while the Indonesian and ASEAN opportunities for R327G are very exciting, the company is also advancing quickly towards the other phase three program in R327G. 
Can you provide us with some details on the planned goals and timelines for the Australian phase three program in acute bacterial skin and skin structure infections or ABSSI, as you mentioned earlier? Yeah, so ABSSI is really focused upon Australia, yes, but really it's positioned for the US FDA itself. It's done to a US FDA standard. Uh, and in fact, the Indonesian study is done to a US FDA standard as well. Uh, but the Australian study is the most likely that the US would uh, embrace. And really, it's, it, was it is probably a quarter or two behind the DFI study itself. We've really committed our resources to the DFI study initially, uh, which then allow us to now um, focus more resources, of course, on the Australian study. The benefit that we have of, in Australia um, is that it could be approved uh, at the tail end of next year. But we also have the benefit that when we submit it to the US FDA, we don't just submit this wonderful Australian study done to their standard. We also submit the, the, all the compelling DFI data that we would have in the background of hundreds of patients, plus the hundreds of patients of here. So we go into the US with a position of power. I think too often companies will do the study that they'd expect the US FDA to approve and the FDA goes, oh, we'd like to see a bit more. Well, how about we've got one study done to the FDA and another one done to an international guideline that does fall under the ABSSI um, banner because uh, DFI is a subset of ABSSI and submit that. I think that'll be a pretty compelling data pack, but we'll wait and see. Exactly. because As you mentioned, uh, the uh, DFI is a subset of ABSSI. So in your view, um, the ABSSI market must be sub substantially larger. So how large is it if you, you know, in terms of Australia or let's say in the US and Europe, do you have any estimates in terms of how large the market could be for this type of product? Those, those two markets, uh, if I have my stats correctly, are worth around, well, from an AB triple SI perspective is around 12 billion US dollars uh, per year. Interestingly for DFI, so the subset of that, I was recently in um, Washington DC, uh, speaking with House of Representatives, Congressman and Veteran Affairs, and Veteran Affairs was telling me that for diabetic foot ulcer infections, just within Veteran Affairs themselves, they spend about four billion US dollars per year. So the numbers kind of don't really have how does Veteran Affairs four billion, and the, you know, kind of doesn't really add up. But they they definitely said it was about four billion there, and and um, certainly that is an incredibly compelling um, uh, commercial opportunity. Um, in answering a question in another way, why do we go with DFI as an initial lead? Because of a topical application, the most valuable, price valuable, um, is DFI. Now, if they use it for skin infections, burn infections, surgical infections, doesn't matter. They, they, well, you know, they shouldn't, but whatever. Um, they're paying a DFI price. And I think, as you mentioned, you know, the um, a lot of the, uh, the aim of the ABSSI program is to move towards United States filing and US-based clinical studies. Um, can you give us an update in terms of your timing expectations for potentially filing a, an IND or investigational new drug application in, in the United States? Yeah, so we'd expect a pre-IND meeting uh, with the US FDA late this year. Uh, and that pre-IND meeting is really setting up for an IND, which would be uh, submitted probably around the middle of next year. Uh, and the potential of an NDA could follow soon after. Uh, we've got an excellent relationship with uh, the US FDA where we've had a qualified infectious disease designation awarded for bacteriemia or, or broad spectrum sepsis. To my knowledge, it's the only one in the world, which of course is part of our portfolio. Uh, but this is really coming in with a very safe, well tolerated and, and clearly all indications to date, highly efficacious compound as a topical solution. And, and, and you know, relating to the United States, of course, the company has received the vote of confidence through some initiatives and with a through a cooperative R&D agreement with the U.S. Department of Defense, including a two million dollar grant. Can you provide us with an update or on the developments from this exciting collaboration? Yes, we've actually got uh, two collaborative research agreements with the United States, with the Department of Defense in the United States. Uh, one of those is with the Department of Army, uh, particularly their Burns program. Uh, in fact, we released uh, just last week, I think it was some really compelling um, uh, in vivo being on rat or in on rat uh, burn wound data. That data, by example, uh, has been very well accepted as um, statistically significant, significant or statistically um, uh, more advantageous than the existing method of treatment, which was uh, comparative to one antibiotic. It all had also had statistically significant wound healing properties. 
So that's the burn one. Then we look across to the um, Infectious Disease Institute there. Uh, we recently announced and in fact, I had a poster presentation at the Military Health Symposium there in the US about a month ago. And we showed to work against anthrax. We showed to work against the plague. We showed to work against all sorts of other um, really dangerous uh, threats um, that the US Army is assessing. And uh, certainly those indications today to are pleasing. So that's very impressive, and you know, and I guess relating to this, of course, in terms of the company's ability to to proceed with these collaborations, is the the funding aspect and the operational balance sheet. And Recky recently has has strengthened its balance sheet through a couple of initiatives. There was a fifteen million dollar or fifteen point eight million dollar capital raising, and in the spring, and then I think a thirty million dollar debt financing just recently. Do you expect this funding to support the completion of the two phase three studies in terms of DFI and ABSSI? Yes, the uh, we we do actually, and and how is that possible? Because we received the R and D rebate on top of that. So all of us, all when we spend, I mean, if I just put those numbers together, there thirty plus plus fifteen is obviously about forty five million. Well, consider about forty three and a half cents R and D rebate of that coming back. So I can't do the numbers quickly now, but 45 and go go 43 and a half percent of that as an on top uh, cash runway um, position that gives the significant cash runway advantage of um, of our program. How did we achieve that 15? Well, interestingly enough, that was from just existing shareholders. Um, one bloke, a very nice fellow, put up 10 million himself. Uh, Fidelity, one of the largest big international funds, um, put up the majority of the rest, and then shareholders uh, took took the uh, small component that was left over. And the debt fund itself actually is through um, Avenue Capital Group in the US, uh, where we maintain a wonderful relationship. So with equity, minimizing our dilutionary position by utilizing debt and having the R&D rebate uh, complement things gives us the ability to deliver two phase three studies. That's very exciting. So in closing, what are some of the key milestones and catalysts for Recce that we should expect to hear over the next 12 months or so? Look, I think it's it's really driven around registrational data. Uh, what an incredible uh, time to be. Uh, we have the registrational phase three study for diabetic blood ulcer infections in Indonesia, positioned for if approved there across the ASEAN group of countries into the Middle East and beyond. We have just behind that, the AB triple SI study, in Australia positioned for submission in Australia, but also the US FDA itself. With both programs being late stage clinical programs, we're in the usual partnering discussions. You know, who's gonna distribute it? Who's gonna sell it? Who, who wants to make money and increase their, their market position? Uh, we really give them the opportunity to do that. So I see it an incredibly exciting time, both clinically and commercially um, ahead. Thank you very much for joining us today, James. And we look forward to catching up with you soon on the future developments and the progress, particularly over the next year. It seems like an exciting one for Recky. Thank you again. It certainly is. Yeah, many thanks.